So last but not least, we have uh, Zalando's very own uh, Thomas Santana and Jaroslav Fadin, who will be speaking about uh, K-anonymous... Oh. <laughs> it's a hard word. K-anonymization, or why aggregation is not enough. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we were, I'm um, Thomas, and this is yeah, uh, Slav, we call him Slav, and we were coming here to talk about k right? And, or why aggregation is, is not enough. And um, the idea is to, through this presentation, talk about the, the problem of k and why we're using it, and also it's put that into toolbox when we're, we're looking into, um, into presenting data. So how did we find this? So how did we discover canonization? We were just doing our tool. Our tool, uh, we share data with uh, Zalando partners about customers. So um, what are they buying? What, what's interesting? And we've, we've, we've had always a challenge to do this in a way that complies with GDPR, legal conditions, competition. There's a lot of restrictions applied on us. And we were kind of comfortable feeling, okay, we're doing it the right way. We've gone through all the hoops uh, to get the thing there. but we all of a sudden found out that, hey, there's a couple of corner cases that we should probably be analyzing. So why, why did we find that? So in, in essence, data is valuable and companies want it. So our customers were always asking, can you share more data with us? And then the question is, okay, but we need, also need to take a look at the customer privacy. And Zalando has a very strong uh, concern about preserving both sides, right? So both competition and customer privacy was key for us. So um, why is aggregation not enough? So in general, when you're looking at a single data set, aggregation is normally good enough. So you're looking at one data set, you look, it's okay, I can't really get a lot of this. But as you start adding more context to the data that you have, you start being able to connect data points, right? So maybe you say, hey, this is a woman or a group of women. That in itself isn't too much, but maybe you can connect several data points to start saying, huh, maybe this is a specific group of women. And the real risk that we're trying to avoid here is re-identification. So there's a, there was an article that we read that said that with 33 bits of entropy, you can identify anybody. Basically, we're about 8 billion people in the world. We only need 33 bits of data to enumerate everybody, right? Um, so let's go through an example just to try to make this a little bit more uh, understandable. So let's say we want to identify a person. And if anyone figures out who the person is, uh, just blurt it out and we'll, we'll stop the, the execute. So we know it's a person, so that puts us at 77.7 uh, 7 billion people, right? Um, we can say, okay, it's a female, that gives us one bit of data, right? And that splits our data roughly in 50%. It's not really 50%, but hey, okay. Then we get another bit of data, it's a German person. So this is about 1% of the total number of people in the world. We've now got, out of those 33, we've got seven and a half bits done. We're out to 83 million people. Uh, oops. And then we go in and say, this, this person lives in Berlin, right? That gives us 3.7 million people, and that's another additional 4.5 bits. So we're at 12 bits of information. In itself, that might not be too much, but when we add all of these, we're already down to one and a half million people. Because we know that about half of the people in Berlin are women. We can get better data for this, actually. Um, and then if we add one more, so the age group, we're not even putting the age, we're just putting the age group, so this person is 65 or more. That's actually 19% of the population of Berlin, so about 700,000 people, but if we cross that she's a female, then we know it's about 350,000 people. So this in itself, not too much data, okay? We, it's interesting that with just a little bit of information, we're already down to a very small group of people. Now let's say we go for something more uh, meaningful. So for example, this person's a politician, meaning that she went to votes and you maybe know her or seen her around, right? That, I try to find the number of people that are politicians in Berlin, not easy to find, but they're probably, if you have access to more data, you might get the, the correct number. But then we say, okay, she's a member of the Bundestag. Now this is really, really precise. This is 706 people, right? If I got the number right from Wikipedia about 23 bits of data just in that piece of information. So this is why your aggregation sometimes can be tricky, right? So okay, we have a woman, 65 plus, living in Berlin, Bundestag, who could she be? Now we're gonna pick something else that might be relevant or not, but like favorite clothes, right? 
<laughs> so I haven't given anything really personal here, but you've re-identified the person, or maybe a couple of her companions. <laughs> so this is, this is the example why this can be really dangerous, right? So Slavo, go into the second part. Yeah, hey. So, yeah, if we're talking re-identification, we should mention the so-called term quasi-identifiers. So, you have a data set, you have your attributes, but some attributes, they don't reveal information itself. But a combination of them and linkage with other data sets, they can reveal information. So, these, uh, these identifiers, uh, which are kind of your target, uh, let's call it a quasi-identifier. And uh, there can be different scenarios of what, uh, what is a re-identification. One uh, is the called prosecutor scenario, which means you know that your target uh, person or your target object is in data set. Uh, it's just your job to find it, right? So this is so-called prosecutor attack. And there is another way of attacking, uh, which is called journalist attack, uh, which means you don't care about a particular person or object, you just want to compromise the whole data set. As soon as you find one example where you can identify the person, then you can sue the company or compromise the whole data set. So, then it's kind of the exact problem that we, we hid uh, inside our daily work and we started to, to, to research the papers and our security department saying like, we will shut you down soon. So, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 what we, we found is a can anonymity. Uh, this is a paper from late 90s, uh, the, the in the reference uh, later, so you can check it out. And the idea here is uh, we want to, to hide in a crowd somehow, right? Which means uh, for any, any combination of, uh, of your attributes, you want to guarantee that there is at least K persons who, who are attributed to this group. And uh, as your K gets larger, your an an anonymity is kind of gets stronger. So what does it mean as an example? Uh, you see a medical just data example. We have some persons here: postcode, age, gender, and uh, and the disease. And uh, the the name, for example, is a direct identifier, right? So it's one to one mapping. Then such things as postcode, age, and gender they are they are general identifiers, also quasi identifiers. And the disease is your sensitive attribute, which you want to study and which you want actually to keep in the data set. Um, and this is an example of uh, an anonymized uh, data set, right? So you can see that names just disappear because it's a direct identifier. Then you kind of see that now there is an age group, right? So not age exactly. Then you see that postcodes uh, don't have uh, exact numbers and so on. Uh, so the, there should be kind of guarantees in order for this to work. So first of all, your, your sensitive attributes, such as disease, disease for example, should not uh, reveal information by itself. An example would be the man-only uh, uh, diseases and uh, female-only, right? So there could be a reveal of information. Then your, your diversity for, for your group, once you build it, the, the values that you have in this group should, should be also diverse. Other than that, you can... You can um, I get into problem with such called of uh, homogeneity attack, which a good example would be, uh, for example, we know that, that Bob is in this data set, right? We don't know exactly who is the Bob. Uh, but we know that uh, Bob is 60 plus, and uh, for example, all, uh, all um, persons in this database with 60 plus age have cancer which does mean that uh, without knowing what Bob is, we know that Bob has cancer. So this is so-called homogeneity attack. And uh, also, like keeping your, your data set dimensionality will help if you have uh, time series, for example, combined with location, like person bought this article at this particular day, it will be very hard to, to canonize that. And yeah, also example that I remembered from the US, just knowing your, your zip code, your gender, and your birthday, 90% we can identify any person in the US. So, uh, yeah, what are the approaches of this so-called canonymization? Basically, there are two. One is just we suppress the whole thing, like this attribute will just disappear, and uh, other ways we can generalize. Also, we can choose how, how, how deep we, we should generalize. 
And depending of, of uh, what our decision is, also we can, one attribute is more important for us, so we don't want, if possible, to suppress it. Others, they're okay, we are fine to suppress them. There can be different transformations of your data set. So this uh, canonization is not unique. It's up to you how, how, how you can do it. Yeah, so there are still drawbacks uh, if you do this. As you can see, if you, if you use suppression, right, there will be information loss. Just some values will, will totally disappear. If you suppress, there will be a data distortion, right? So highly possible some kind of unique values will be suppressed because there are not enough uh, just um, uh, entries in the data set to support them. So they will also disappear. It will distort your data. And there is still a room of, of attack for attacks, as usual. Um, there are a couple of them, yeah. But we, uh, we will talk more about the example, right? So what we actually, yeah, what was our exact problem? Yeah, so, so we already had the tool running and we were doing high level aggregations. And then we started to want to look deeper into the data set. So for example, um, some of the brands wanted to know, hey, can you tell me where these products are being bought? What cities are being bought, right? And at, at first glance, it looked to us like, okay, yeah, that seems trivial. But then when we started looking into zip codes, we get into this position. Zip code plus age plus, plus gender kind of already identifies. You got a lot of bits of data in that, right? And we got the pushback, and we started looking. The first feeling we had, it was science fiction. Like, you cannot do this, right? This is exaggerated. But then when we started looking at the data, as you applied filters on the existing tool, you could really narrow down and start tracking uh, individuals done and if we added additional dimensions for sure we would be hitting really small numbers just as an example I once found uh, three people in Ireland within an age group that each one bought in a different device I knew that because it was 33 33 33 percent so yep that's three people or six or nine but it was very small number so our approach was okay let's look at all our data and see what we can do so what do we wanted to do? We wanted to find K that would ensure that at least K customers were behind every grouping in our tool. So we went through the entire tool checking this out. And one of the ways to figure this out is just do direct counting. You can say, hey, how many sold items do I have per city? Count also the customers. If you have at least K customers, then I can show the data, right? But this gets tricky when you start putting time series and filtering and other things that are not necessarily sold items, like for example, sessions how many sessions happened. It's really hard to track sessions to individuals. Not everybody's logged in. Uh, so then we, 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 we decided to tackle this through an approximated counting, right? So what was the idea here? Uh, some of the data we won't really be able to tie directly to a customer to be absolutely guaranteed that they were, were isolated. So sessions is a good example. Um, and the other one is if we carry customer ID everywhere, our data set would just blow in size and there was no way we could deliver reports to our customers. So the approach we decided to take, and we, we discussed this with the privacy team and tried several variations. At a certain point, they were saying, okay, I think you guys are going far enough. But the idea was, let's count, how many, for example, how many items does one person buy? So I find one, one user or one person, how many items did he buy that day? Then I start accumulating this over an, the entire period. So how many items did he buy in the last 60 days? And then we kind of, if we get the maximum, obviously, they would be very high. There are always outliers, but we say, okay, let's go for 95%. We also tried different levels and discussing with privacy. But we decided to go with 95. So let's say that this is not the real number, but there's 17 people bought 90, 95% uh, of people bought less than 17 items in the last period of time. So this gives us uh, an estimation of, of how we're going. But then we had another problem, which is, okay, I have this per day, but how do I extend? So if I want to see 30 days, should I just do 30 times, 17 times the number of people I want in the set? That's going to be really coarse grain. And you can believe that product was not happy when we tried this because basically everything was gone uh, as soon as you started applying filters because uh, the, the sensitivity was really high. So then we did, um, compared to the sound thing, it's a really naive approach. So <laughs> we decided, okay, let's calculate over a period of time. So let's see in the past, uh, 150 days, 95% of the people bought about 80 items, right? So this is, this is how we were targeting this. And then our initial approach was, okay, let's try to find a number. We could try to fit a nice machine model to this, but 
We also wanted something that was easy to put in SQL for our reporting engine, so we had limitations on how we could do it. So we tried a couple of models. The initial one was a quadratic model, and then we were just double checking just to make sure, and then we found out that, hey, the quadratic model, which is the blue line, actually doesn't work as we extend time over. And we tried several different models that we could get from the toolkits that we had, and we were really, we found it interesting that we basically the atomic half-life one kind of matches our customers. So they get born, they are active for a while, then they disappear. So maybe we, uh, we're not gonna share the numbers, but maybe our customers have a half-life and we're not exactly sure why. <laughs> so this was how we, we kind of, this is, the mod, this is the initial model that we're using, and we're always trying to improve this. So either we get more data on the data set so that we can do direct counting when possible, or we try to re recalibrate this so that it gets more precise, uh, because this is really important for, for customers. Um, this is some of the references we had. Uh, the first one I read was the, the fourth one here, which is a nice introduction about the whole problem of privacy. And then Slav went through the other ones, we go more precisely on the definitions. Um, then, and it's an interesting topic, and we hope that you guys can uh, leverage this in, in, in your work, especially if you're going to share data with other customers. That's what we had. It's a throw, not a getter. <laughs> it's a throw box, not a catch box. Yeah. <laughs> Questions in the back. Attention. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, okay. Okay. Um, have you have you made comparisons of how much that anonymization alters the distribution of distinct features? or uh, even more the, the uh, for instance, joint distributions or uh, dependent distributions, stuff like this? Uh, no, and in part is we're not hitting, um, so the data we're giving out is, is presented as reports to our partners, right? Um, some of them want to get the raw data, and this we know already is a huge problem, so we have to figure out. Um, so for, for our use cases, this was not a critical point. This kind of leads us to want to actually do more machine learning so we can give insights instead of reports, which would be a lot more efficient and we can, then this information is available for us, but not necessarily on the output of the model. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I don't know a lot about this topic, but maybe uh, did you look into adding noise to your data so that instead of aggregating to, to kind of coarse levels, you could give a data set that is properly enough, like, uh, yeah, uh, randomized in a sense that your distributions and statistical settings will still be proper on average, but you don't actually, yeah, you don't have to go to a higher coarse level. Good question. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice question, never thought about it. Um, but yeah, just to mention here, so. There are two ways how we can approach the problem, right? One way is more what your suggestions, so actually work with the, the with the raw data set itself, right? So you can actually ignore it. Yeah, I think it's a valid idea. Then you can actually suppress some entities in the data set itself, right? So it will be it will be smaller, it will be distorted, and so on. What we did, uh, like we did it kind of on the client side, right? So data should never come to the client in an anonymized way, so it should be already anonymized. But what we did, we just uh, generalized, right? So we, we said, like, instead of age, we, we now have an age group. Instead of city, we now have some kind of area, and so on. And values that we just could not show, we, um, we suppressed. But yeah, the idea about the modifying the, the underlying data set, I think it's actually valid. And the whole topic of uh, like anonymizing data inside Zalando is, is very hot right now. I think maybe Max also knows something about it. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we are thinking about actually how to anonymize it on the data level. So even working in Zalando that you could not be able to, to read the uh, identify the personal data, right? And for this, you will have to, to work with the data itself somehow. This is a hot topic, so we, uh, we, can, we can discuss uh, afterwards as well. Thank you. I can't catch. Okay. Thanks again.
Give a round of applause, please.